You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Welcome to this episode of the Disease Du Jour podcast on the topic of kissing spines in horses with Dr. Jose Garcia Lopez. I'm your host, Kim Brown, editor of Equal Management. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2023 by Merck Animal Health. Dr. Garcia Lopez, VMD, is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons and a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine Rehabilitation. He is an associate professor of large animal surgery at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, Department of Clinical Studies at New Bolton Center. Thank you, Dr. Garcia Lopez, for joining us today on Disease Du Jour to talk about kissing spines. Thank you, Kim, so much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Well, I want to jump right in because what, in your experience, are some of the initial complaints that would lead you to look for kissing spines? That's a great, it's a great intro, introductory question because it does have a bunch of different potential you know, ramifications. So your classic presentation is a horse that when they are actually settling her up or settling him up, uh, the horse all of a sudden is quite resistant to the saddle and to put pressure across, you know, on top of their back. Um, uh, in some other cases, actually, the saddling is okay, but then when they get under, uh, going under saddle and riding, they notice that as soon as they start to have to ask for some level of engagement, the horse will uh, all of a sudden change in attitude, get kind of sour, uh, would not like to stay on the right lead, start bucking, and sometimes can become quite violent. Um, however, uh, I also get, especially in, in some of the uh, English sport disciplines, a little bit more subtle complaints in the sense of like a uh, horse with not enough impulsion uh, uh, and maybe a little tight across the back, but not necessarily this, you know, these horror stories that you hear of like the horse is uncontrollable. No, like a horse that I can actually do their job, but they are actually uh, 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 maybe not pushing or not performing the way that historically they have. And they notice okay. some subtle changes in attitude. So it really can vary from very subtle, you know, uh, not quite right performance uh, results to situations in which the horse is basically quite violent uh, or even unrideable uh, 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 because of the change in behavior, temperament, and just that uncontrollable, like, you know, uh, 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 reaction that they have when they ask them to do certain things or they get also so preconditioned that as soon as you get a saddle close by, the horse basically wants to not have anything to do with it. So it oh, really wow. can have a wide range of uh, presentation. Okay. So once you have the thought that this may be in your diagnosis, how do you diagnose it? Can you offer our veterinarians some tips? Yeah. So this is the part that it actually um, it's uh, we still have to do quite a bit of education because it, it is an issue. Uh, so. Um, to me, so one of the misconceptions that we've had is, OK, the horse is maybe a little sore across the back. I'm going to take radiographs. And then because of the radiographs look abnormal or they look, quote unquote, that we're kissing or overriding on the dorsal spinous processes, that is the reason for the problem that we're seeing in this particular patient. And, uh, and the reality is, and this is actually just not opinion, but looking at data, there's plenty of uh, publications now dating, you know, through the Jeffco. Jeff got present, uh, publications in the 90s that show that especially horses that are going into English disciplines that are, you know, off the track thoroughbreds, up to like, you know, 90 percent uh, of horses could have radiographic changes that could be compatible with some degree of kissing spine. And maybe around half of those do have, you know, clinical evidence of back pain. So meaning that the radiographic appearance of the back alone, it's really a very, very poor predictor for a horse mm -hmm. that is suffering clinically from kissing spine. They could have radiographic changes compatible with kissing spines, but doesn't mean that they necessarily are clinically uh, 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 suffering from this condition. So this, uh, this is one thing that we, uh, we spend a lot of time discussing with, with clients and with veterinarians because 
you know, uh, the CISO is all, it's almost become also an issue during pre-purchase examinations. Do we, do we take back films or not? And then if they, we see abnormalities, how do we interpret it? Because we know that a significant amount of horses will have, especially thoroughbreds, will have radiographic changes regardless of whether they have back pain or not. So that's a big, big thing. So um, I try to, um, in order to try to have the best possible uh, chance of have being accurate and have you know do well on your case selection when it comes to horses with back pain, you do want to have a very good history of what's been going on with the horse. First of all, uh, you cannot get pigeonhole into one track. You want to see any changes in in uh, in uh, in routine, any changes in exercise. Has the horse all of a sudden gone up in exercise, or is he moving up in uh, let's say it's an eventer? And it's, uh, or a dressage horse or a jumper, and it's going from a meter 30 to a meter 40. Is there a change uh, in, the, in the amount of work that that, that horse is doing? Um, also, is there's been a change in rider, there's been a change in, uh, in diet, et cetera. So all those things could actually be factors that could be quite important. Then after that, uh, you obviously want to do a full lameness evaluation. You want to see how the horse moves. You want to see how the horse moves his or her back at a trot and a canter. Does it guard it? Or do the paxial muscles seem to be twitching or engage, you know, or, or or fasciculating when they go from a trot to a canter uh, type gait? So all those things become quite important. Uh, and then lastly, obviously, you want to have a visual of how is this horse doing from a musculature standpoint, top line. How are the how is the muscling? not only across the back, but you want to also include the neck, the back, and the gluteal uh, hind end region, because all these things, we know that they're connected. Uh, and then finally, obviously, I'm going to be doing a physical exam. I'm going to be palpating. I'm going to be asking for range of motion, uh, how much convex uh, flexion and extension of the back the horse can do. Are we resistant uh, uh, to any of these manipulations, et cetera? So I put all those things as part of the context, then I could actually do the radiographs if I have suspicion of back. And then uh, a lot of times what I like to do, because we also do have evidence that if we do several modalities together when it comes to imaging, uh, we, we actually increase our um, successful identification of cases uh, uh, that are truly suffering from uh, uh, kissing or overriding dorsal spinous processes. And that is by actually doing a nuclear scintigraphic bone scan uh, of the back region in particular. Um, we have some very nice uh, evidence to, that show that if you actually have a regions of significant radioisotope optic showing active bone inflammation, and then you put it together with the radiographic findings, that one plus one equals actually more than two. Um, it can actually bring your accuracy when it comes to diagnosing this type of condition up to like an 80%. If you just look at the bone scan alone, you're gonna be much lower. If you look at an X-ray alone, it's gonna be actually like a 20% accuracy. So uh, okay. combining these two modalities is quite helpful. And then also there's some work that um, uh, uh, has been done um, both here at Penn and also when I was at back at Tufts in New England, uh, we looked at those uh, combining the modalities and how they can do long-term, but also here the work that Dr. Brown, Cara Brown did uh, in the sports medicine section with regards to these horses with back pain is that once you identify an area that is suspicious, whether it's radiographs and with bone scan, going and performing a block of the area with an aesthetic mm. in, the, in the particular interspinal spaces uh, could actually not only enhance your accuracy, but also those horses that block nicely did much better post-operatively or post-treatment, uh, whatever, you know, met, you know, whatever method uh, was chosen. Today's Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you by Banamine, Flunix and Meglumine injection from Merck Animal Health. The pioneer NSAID for horses in the U.S., Banamine goes to work quickly to alleviate pain and inflammation from musculoskeletal disorders and visceral pain from colic to horses in your care. Don't get caught on call without Banamine. Find out more at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Do not use banamine in horses intended for human consumption. The effect of banamine paste on pregnancy has not been determined. See product label for complete safety information. Oh, well, that's a great tip. I really, really appreciate you adding that in. So once you've diagnosed it, you're pretty sure that this is what you're dealing with. 
how do you like to proceed with different types of cases? Because I know every case is not the same. Yeah. So once I have, let's say that I have, I have a patient that does fit the criteria and we do, we have some radiographs and then also we do a scintigraphic evaluation and those areas, uh, we identified which areas have radiographic abnormalities and scintigraphic abnormalities together. Then in an ideal world, we would love to block them to say, yep, this, if you block the spaces that are showing abnormalities, this horse is moving better. Uh, depending on the amount of inflammation that I see on the bone scan, and also depends a little bit on what's happening history-wise. If a horse is one that is freshly diagnosed, uh, medical management of this of these cases uh, in the you know uh, which basically includes uh, injection of anti-inflammatory medications in those affected interspinal spaces, uh, together with um, therapies such as methyl, uh, mesotherapy, acupuncture. Uh, and soma chiropractic mobilization and strengthening work could actually be very, very effective. And it has been shown that it's highly effective. The only issue is that a lot of times it's short-lived, meaning that it could be anywhere from three to five months, and then you have to repeat everything again. Uh, but in horses that nothing has been done medically, I think that's a very good option. A lot of times what we see is horses that have been identified partially on the field, have been treated medically on the field, uh, and have had some response, but then regress, and then they come back to see a specialist, let's say, uh, and then we do the bone scans and we confirm, yep, this is the issue. And then those ones in which medical management either has been very short-lived or not very effective, then those are the ones that we're going to uh, recommend surgical intervention. Um, depending on the characteristics of that particular back, meaning how close together the spaces are, but also even as importantly, how inflamed or how active are they on scintigraphy, then we're going to choose between the two general options, which one is that interspinous uh, ligament desmotomy, in which you split the ligament in between the, uh, the affected uh, dorsal spinous processes, or what's also called a segmental wedge ostectomy, which is what some people, uh, you know, call out there, the, you know, kind of like this horrible term, shaving. Uh, which is really is should not be mentioned that it's actually a sub, subtotal wedge ostectomy, which you actually remove a piece of bone from the affected dorsal spinous process to basically be able to uh, 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 increase mobilization of the area. Uh, and then following that, then they go into a pretty strict rehabilitation program. And that also then becomes a key part. In the horses that have either medical treatment or surgical treatment, that tr the treatment, whether it's medical or surgical, is aimed at increasing the flexibility of the back. So then the horse can actually have a proper rehabilitation uh, work so they can get stronger. They can, you know, those epaxial and multifidus unstabilizing muscles of the back can actually get properly developed so then they can do their job. The surgery is not a shortcut to just go back to work. The surgery is a way for you to be able to move the back better so you can actually work the muscles so the muscles can get stronger. And this goes, actually, this actually is even based on some of the work on the human side that have shown humans with lower back pain have quite a bit of atrophy of some of these stabilizing muscles. And as soon as you do whatever treatment you do and they do physiotherapy, those stabilizing muscles increase in size and they become you know, uh, active again. And that actually has a very direct correlation with how well they can do long term. So our management, whether it's surgical or medical, is aimed at then mixing it with a rehabilitation schedule so they can actually get stronger so they can go back to what they're supposed to be doing. Oh, that's that's a great overview of that. And as far as follow up, when you have treated some of these horses and then they've gone into rehab, what is the process, and, and then how does a veterinarian want to follow up on these? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the, when it comes to the rehab, you know, people have different strategies. Uh, the ones that we use in general is usually we have these horses rest for a month uh, with stall rest, hand walking, and then they can go into a small paddock, and then they have another month to six weeks of work on the ground, either with some sort of uh, strengthening system like a peso or an equiband in which they engage their core musculature without a rider on top. So we're working on the ground at a walk trot, adding ground poles, cavaletti, so we can increase the flexion and extension and we can build up those muscles and we can do the 
carrot stretches in, that people have done for many years to also help strengthen the muscles because we do have good evidence that certain exercises uh, when it comes to carrot stretch or movements do help develop the muscle quite nicely in this area. And then, so I usually are on the eight or 10 week period plus uh, following either surgery or medical management, but in particular surgery, I, uh, you know, I usually work with a referring veterinarian to do an evaluation. And that evaluation includes taking a repeat set of films, which is more than anything to have a sense of how things are looking, but it doesn't dictate much of anything. Usually the more important part becomes their physical exam, manipulation of the back, watch them exercise to make sure that they have good muscle development, they have good mobility, and then once they have that, then we're okay to start getting under saddle and start legging the horse up. Uh, but um, the big key here is that we want to make sure that we have good epaxial muscle development and you know and good strength on that core uh, and with good flexibility. And the X-rays is more to make sure that things are kosher, but doesn't there's no correlation between how much open the space look now versus before surgery. So the degree of amplitude between the interspinous processes or, or the dorsal spinous processes that interspinous space widening has really no there's no statistical evidence to say that we need to have X amount of space to be able to have a good outcome. Uh, the outcome seems to be related more in good case selection, identifying the true areas that are that are hurting. So not just because they're kissing, they're hurting. You can have ones that are hurting and some that are not. So treating the ones that are not may not be that important. Uh, but then ultimately is to be able to have good muscle development so we can actually then uh, have the strength to hold the core and hold that spine and uh, and strengthen the spine so we can do the job. Okay, and for the horses, and, and let's take both the cases to, that you've talked about, whether it's medical or surgical, what are the long-term prognoses? Because I know some people go, as you mentioned on the pre-purchase exam, oh my gosh, that looks like their you know, spinal processes are too close together, I'm not gonna do anything. but. We know these horses can go back to work. Yep. So, so that's a great question. So basically, the prognosis for mm -hmm. these horses, uh, and this is based on some studies that we've done, uh, especially with the interspinous ligament desmonomy, uh, it's actually quite good um, for them to be able to go back to work. We've got anywhere between 80 and 88% of these horses wow. are able to go back to work. However, case selection is key. and the uh, the other part that is also key is that uh, um, a, a good number of these horses, especially horses that are competing at a high level that develop these issues, have a good chance of competing back, going back to their uh, discipline, but at a lower level. So one thing that we have to ensure that owners know is like these horses can go back to work and the chances of going back to work is really good, but they also have a moderate chance of having to drop in class. That's a very good point. And is there anything else that you would offer for, through your experience and your research about kissing spines to veterinarians in the field? Yeah, my main thing is just going back to don't don't forget your physical exam and don't necessarily get definitive just because the films look abnormal. Um, it's extremely important if let's say that scintigraph is not available, but you have area an area radiographically that looks bad and you cannot do scintigraphy, which will obviously give you a better chance of having a right diagnosis, I would then say block the area uh, to then be able to confirm it at least. Uh, without the, you, by, if you guide yourself only by films, there's gonna be a very significant good percentage uh, of the times that you will be Unfortunately, not having a good case selection, which is not going to give you a good outcome because you still have not identified the whole nature of the of the of the of the reason for the horse's complaint. Well, that that is some really good advice. And I really do appreciate you, Dr. Garcia Lopez, for joining me on this episode of Disease Du Jour. And we want to thank our audience for listening to Disease Du Jour and a special thanks to our 2023 sponsor, Merck Animal Health, that allows us to have these conversations. And if you have any questions or suggestions, you can send an email to me at kbrown, that's the letter kbrown, at equinenetwork.com. And again, Dr. Garcia Lopez, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much.